In this room are three terrorists. Another is seen smiling in this photo of a school class trip. Nothing in these rare images sets the men apart from the people around them. Or hints at the horrifying suicide mission they would one day carry out. In time, their names and faces became known all over the world. They were the leaders of the September 11th hijackers. Four young men who met as students in the German city of Hamburg. While the 9-11 Commission report provides a detailed account of their activities, this program goes further, taking a new and exclusive look into their secretive world. Seen here are some of the terrorists' secret communications, as well as classified documents and interrogation records. This new information paints a startling portrait of the core members of the Hamburg cell. The men responsible for the deaths of nearly 3,000 people. In September 2002, one of those core members, Ramzi bin al Sheib, was captured in Karachi. Following his arrest, bin al Sheib was taken to an undisclosed location and interrogated repeatedly. This confidential US Justice Department document is a record of the secrets he relayed. Bin al Sheib told interrogators how he and three other men followed an underground network of operatives into Pakistan, Afghanistan, and finally into the den of Al-Qaeda, where they pledged their loyalty to Osama bin Laden and committed themselves to a suicide mission for the glory of Allah. These are the men of the Hamburg cell. Marwan al Shahi, Ramzi bin al Sheikh, Ziad Jara, and Mohammed Atta. If they were somehow super sophisticated, super intelligent, um, superiorly evil creatures, that'd be better because there aren't very many people like that in the world. But they're just ordinary guys. They're just a bunch of guys. That's what's scary. Other terrorist operatives are known to have worked within their group. But these four men were the nucleus of the secret organization. Their base of operation was here, 54 Marienstrasse in Hamburg. The apartment was sparsely furnished. One of its few concessions to the modern world was a high-speed internet connection. In private conversations, the men called their base Dar el Ansar, the house of the followers. Here they would watch videotapes of Muslim radicals calling for a holy war against the United States. They referred to the U.S. as America the Satan and the head of the snake. Voices often became so loud, neighbors complained about the noise. The leader of the group was Mohammed Atta. As a child in Cairo, Atta had been raised in a strict and reclusive household. His family had few friends and rarely spoke with neighbors. They were not particularly religious. Atta's father, a lawyer, wanted his children to focus on their education. Atta and his two older sisters were instructed to study diligently 
and were rarely allowed to play. Their walk home from school was timed, so if they weren't home by a certain time, someone would go looking for them. In 1992, Atta arrived in Hamburg to study for his degree in urban planning at the Technical University of Hamburg Harburg. Shortly after his arrival, Atta asked for the location of the nearest mosque. He visited several mosques before finding Al Quds in Hamburg's red light district, on a street known for drug trafficking and prostitution. Atta was a guy who was so repressed that he, you know, he, he didn't like eating. To walk from the rail station and to pass through this, it must have felt like running a gauntlet. This rare video reveals the private world inside the mosque. You walk into it, and it's a quite warm and friendly place. I mean, it's a, it has a, a, the real sense of a boys' clubhouse. Uh, people embrace, uh, touch cheeks with one another, a smile or warm handshakes. Many of Al Quds members held strict and radical views of Islam. The highly disciplined and serious Atta quickly became a regular visitor to the mosque. Another member of Al Quds was 23 year old Ramzi bin Al Sheib. Bin Al Sheib left his home in Yemen and moved to Germany, taking advantage of its generous welfare benefits. He registered as an asylum seeker and collected a monthly check from the government. Like Atta, Bin Al Sheib became heavily involved with Al Quds. The two men soon formed a small prayer group, encouraging their members to follow a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. Atta challenged himself to live by a rigid code of behavior, saying that he rarely laughed because joy kills the heart. He told a friend once that he was reluctant to all pleasure, which is a striking sentence. He dressed in virtually the same clothes every day. He ate the same food. Uh, as far as anybody knows, he never read for pleasure. He read the Quran. By 1998, Ziad Jarrah had joined their meetings. Jarrah's fun-loving personality was in striking contrast to Atta's stern behavior. Jarrah had been raised in a middle-class family in Beirut, where he was known for finding the best clubs and bars. Though he came to Germany to study, once there he quickly fell in love with a young woman named Isil Sengun, the daughter of Turkish immigrants. But like the others, the young playboy soon fell under the spell of radical Muslim teachings. His new religious fervor brought about a change in his relationship with Isil. He often criticized her for wearing clothes he considered revealing and told her he was ashamed of her for drinking alcohol. Yet he never ended the relationship. One of the last to join the group that would one day be called the Hamburg Cell was an easygoing young man named Marwan al Shehi, a native of the United Arab Emirates. Although al Shehi had a harsh interpretation of Islam, he would discuss his militant views with charm and warmth. He sang and laughed uh, songs about joining the jihad, about becoming a martyr. In Arabic, jihad can have two very different meanings, either a personal struggle or a holy war. Increasingly, the young men saw themselves as soldiers of Allah, waiting for a call to arms. On the 7th of August 1998, their quest gained momentum. <laughs> Al 
Al-Qaeda, under the direction of Osama bin Laden, bombed two American embassies in East Africa. The terror attack followed bin Laden's fatwa, or Islamic ruling, calling for a holy war against America. Like many young Muslim radicals, Atta was impressed by the Al-Qaeda attack. When one member of the prayer group complained to Atta that the United States was too powerful to confront, Atta disagreed. There are ways, he said. The US is not almighty. The men from Hamburg had decided their future. They put their personal affairs in order, wrote wills, and assigned power of attorney. There seemed to be a sense of wanting to get everything finished uh, to be ready. In a note to himself, Ziad Jara wrote, I come to you with men who love death just as you love life. Oh, the smell of paradise is rising. Their newfound determination would bring the Hamburg cell to the terrorist training camps of Afghanistan and face to face with Osama bin Laden. In early 1999, four students based in Hamburg pledged themselves to a radical holy war. Mohammed Atta, Marwan al-Shehi, Ramzi bin al-Shib, and Ziad Jara. These men would one day become known as the Hamburg Cell. This rare video shows three of the men at a friend's wedding. On the surface, they appear like any other guest. Jara sits cross-legged on the floor. Bin al Sheib makes a moving speech. <laughs> And Al Shehi sings a song about martyrdom. But underneath their placid exteriors, the men were hiding a dangerous secret. The radical teachings they'd learned at Al Quds Mosque had convinced them to become martyrs for their faith. Though they had no idea what their mission would be, it was only a matter of time before they joined the ranks of terrorists. By now, their association with religious extremists had come to the attention of German intelligence. This classified document is a record of a telephone call made in January 1999 between Hamburg cell member Marwan al Shehi and a known Al-Qaeda recruiter named Mohammed Zamar. The conversation was recorded through a top-secret German intelligence wiretap. On paper, the conversation seems harmless. They discuss the possibility of traveling in the near future. Government operatives thought the two men may have been planning to go to a terrorist training camp, but German authorities failed to act on their suspicions. They didn't investigate them very closely, and that's partly because they weren't out-and-out -out criminals, but it's also partly that um, there's a lot of tension between uh, European society and that portion of the society that's uh, Muslim. The laws in Germany are actually very favorable to religious organizations. Because of the Nazi past, Germans are panic-stricken at the idea that they could be um, accused of um, tampering with uh, religious issues. So if you're a terrorist and if you want to go to Europe, Germany uh, in particular was perceived as the sanctuary. As the Hamburg Four searched for a way to translate their violent ideals into action, Mohammed Atta was having second thoughts. Over the years, Atta had made several trips back to his native Egypt to look for work and visit his family. One of these trips was made in 1999. During that visit, 
Atta told his ailing mother that living abroad had made him homesick, that he wanted to stop his studies and return to Egypt to care for her. He knew, I think at some level, that he didn't want to go where he was going, and that by far the easier thing would be to be told to stay home, to come home. But his mother told him to go back to Germany, saying the most important thing for Atta was to finish his studies, maybe even go to the United States to get his PhD. When Atta failed to find a job in Cairo, he left Egypt and never returned. Back in Hamburg, Atta found work as a part-time draftsman for an urban planning firm. I believe this was a very difficult experience for him. For a long time, he felt like the people in Egypt didn't even need him. And I can imagine that black smoke inside him accumulating more and more and more, becoming thicker and thicker. Another member of the Hamburg cell, Ziad Jarrah, was also doubting his convictions. His girlfriend, Isil, witnessed this struggle. She would uh, try to bring him back into the, the realm that she knew him in. And she saw it as a war between her and the religion for him. But her efforts failed. By late 1999, Ziad Jarrah, Marwan al-Shehi, Ramzi bin al-Shib, and Mohammed Atta would eventually find their way to al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan. Connections they had made through the radical Al-Quds Mosque had convinced them that this would be an important step on their way to becoming martyrs. The men traveled individually to avoid suspicion. Bin al-Shib detailed their journey in this confidential interrogation record. One by one, they arrived in the Pakistani town of Quetta. Once there, they asked to meet a man named Al-Mazri. The name was a code, signaling terrorist operatives to usher them across the Afghan border and into Al-Qaeda's den. Officials of the radical Taliban government, who were working with Osama bin Laden, confiscated the men's passports and instructed them to pick assumed names. The men of the Hamburg cell had taken their first steps into the shadowy world of Al-Qaeda. Facilities at the desert camps were spartan. Three or four makeshift buildings served as headquarters. Recruits lived in small tents. Ammunition was in short supply. Days began with a prayer, followed by several hours of physical training, running, weightlifting, and target practice. Their training was also part of a sophisticated sorting process that looked for skills useful to Al-Qaeda. Especially prized were militants with advanced technical and language skills, like the men from Hamburg. When you get somebody like Atta and Ziyad who speak perfect English uh, in, in the, uh, German as well, they can mix with um, Westerners a bit easily. They are completely different caliber. In the eyes of Al-Qaeda, they were the perfect men to lead a mission for their jihad. Shortly after the men arrived, they were summoned to Al-Qaeda's house of Gamdi in Kandahar. There, the Hamburg Four met Osama bin Laden and pledged their loyalty to him. Bin Laden then asked if they would accept a martyrdom operation. They agreed. The men had talked about becoming martyrs in a holy war for years. Now their moment had come. Bin Laden chose Mohammed Atta to be the leader of the group. Atta was a very focused guy he, and would do what he was told. Given a problem, he would work it through uh, and without distraction. 
the Hamburg Four were now assigned to what bin Laden called the planes operation. Their task would be to hijack aircraft and use them to strike targets in the United States. They were sent from Kandahar to meet a man named Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was to give them operational details. More specific training included how to use code words in conversation, how to interpret airline timetables and make travel reservations. Finally, the men were instructed to return to Hamburg and apply to flight schools. The four were no longer radicals looking for a fight, but a terrorist cell. Soon, they would head to the United States to carry out their mission. In late 1999, Mohammed Atta, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, Marwan al-Shehi, and Ziad Jara, the core members of the Hamburg cell, pledged themselves to become martyrs in what they called the Plains Operation, an ambitious plot using commercial aircraft to strike landmark buildings in America. One by one, the men left an Al-Qaeda training camp and returned to Germany. On his trip, Ziad Jara barely escaped capture. Customs inspectors at Dubai airport became suspicious when they noticed that Jara had pasted a page of the Quran into his passport. When they searched his luggage, they discovered piles of radical Muslim propaganda. What he did next remains a mystery to terrorism experts worldwide. He talked freely about his future plans. He did tell the people in Dubai airport was that he was planning on going to America to learn how to fly. Officials in Dubai insist that they informed US authorities about the incident. But the CIA says that no such warning was ever received. After interrogating Jara for four hours, officials released him. In time, the men regrouped in Hamburg. Their visit to Osama bin Laden had not caused a single ripple within German intelligence. Then they were listed as Hamburg students, as normal students. But nobody knew, especially the German police did not know, that they were self-educating terrorists. As instructed by Al-Qaeda, they destroyed their passports to erase all record of their travels. They reported the documents lost and were promptly issued new passports. They shared their Muslim dress and rarely attended Al-Quds Mosque, hoping to disappear into the crowd. After months without contact, Ziad Jara suddenly appeared on his girlfriend, Isil's doorstep. He refused to tell her where he'd been, but was soon talking about taking flying lessons. Meanwhile, the Hamburg cell began researching flight schools in the United States. By early 2000, Atta, Jara and al Shehi had received their US visas without difficulty. They came from good families, they had no police record, and increasingly that's what Al-Qaeda is looking for in its operatives, is that they're clean. But Ramzi bin al Sheib would never get the necessary visa to become the fourth pilot. He was rejected uh, solely because he was seen as a likely economic migrant, not because he was suspected of being a terrorist. That March, Mohammed Atta emailed 31 different flight schools to inquire about their courses. Atta wrote, We are a small group, two to three, of young men from different Arab countries. We would like to start training for the career of airline professional pilots. By the spring of 2000, Jara had been accepted to a flight school in Venice, Florida. This is Jara's contract with the Florida Flight Training Center. Atta and Al Shehi would apply to a different flight school in the Venice area. To avoid suspicion, the three men took separate flights to the US, and that summer, each one passed through Newark International Airport without incident. There's no crime, there's no police record, there's really no intelligence record against them. 
Bin al Shib stayed behind in Hamburg. His job would be to help funnel instructions and money from Al Qaeda to the men in the US. Meanwhile, the members of the Hamburg cell arrived in Florida and tried to blend in with the locals in the sun drenched coastal town of Venice. They wore khakis and polo shirts. They did most of their shopping at Walmart. They ate at Pizza Huts, and it's almost a typical American life. That summer, Atta and Al Shahi started their flying lessons at Huffman Aviation, where they caught the attention of their fellow students. The first time that I set eyes on them, what struck me was um, Muhammad Atta had a bearing about him which was very rigid, very steely eyes. There was never a flicker of emotion in his eyes, never. And al Shahi seemed to be the one that, that was a little bit more relaxed, bumbling after him, if you like. According to other students, Atta and al Shahi were rarely seen apart. Atta was usually giving orders, which al Shahi dutifully obeyed. Their relationship even sparked a rumor that Atta was a prince and that al Shahi was his servant. According to Anne Greaves, the two men received special attention from the instructors. And I do remember saying to my flight instructor one day, why is it that these guys they seem to me to get preferential treatment? What, who are they? What, what are they doing here? And uh, the flight instructor replying to me that they were Arab royalty, that the man we now know as Muhammad Atta was a prince. I said, I don't believe they're royalty. No way. I said, for one thing, they don't have the manners. At night, the two often stopped by the Outlook pub for a drink. They drank, they left the bartenders nice tips, you know. I mean, Muhammad Atta was the person that I actually talked to and, you know, asked him, where, where are you from, you know, trying to make him feel a little bit more comfortable and, uh, dumb me, and uh, he said he was from Germany. And I, I looked at him and I thought, boy, you don't look like a German to me. At the end of July, both Atta and Al Shehi took their solo flights, and in mid-August, they passed their pilot's test. Classes and other expenses were paid for through wire transfers to a joint bank account set up by Atta and Al Shehi. U.S. investigators would later discover financial documents that showed between July and September of 2000, the men of the Hamburg cell received more than $100,000, money traced to Al-Qaeda operatives overseas. That summer, a highly classified military intelligence unit called Able Danger reportedly alerted the Pentagon to Atta and al Shehi's presence in the U.S. Using data mining techniques, the unit identified the men as potential members of an Al-Qaeda terror cell. But Pentagon officials decided not to inform the FBI, because the men were holding valid U.S. entry visas. In December, Atta and al Shehi used their pilot's licenses to gain access to a highly sophisticated flight simulator near Miami. The sessions gave the men specialized training to operate a large commercial aircraft. This were individuals that were focused on doing this thing, have been planning this thing for a long time to come, and all they were making sure was that they would not fail. Meanwhile, Ziad Jara was taking flying lessons at the Florida Flight Training Center, also in Venice. Jara's easygoing nature helped him mix better than either Atta or Al Shehi. Ziad had a good sense of humor and mixed very well with the other students. At the time, uh, there was no other Muslim students. And really, the only thing that reminded one of Ziad Jara being a Muslim was his name. For a while, Jara stayed with a fellow student pilot, often making his roommate breakfast before leaving for his lesson. Initially, uh, Ziad was a little slow. He graduated in a normal time. His 
grades were above average. His flying skill, I would say, was uh, above average. By August, Jara, like his co-conspirators, had earned a single-engine private pilot certificate. Phase one of the plane's operation was now complete. Their plans proceeded until a mistake by Atta almost exposed them all. By late 2000, three members of the Hamburg cell, Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Shehi, and Ziad Jara, had earned their pilot licenses at flight schools in Venice, Florida. Back in Hamburg, the fourth member of the cell, Ramzi bin al Sheba, who'd failed to get a visa to the United States, continued to play a vital role in the so-called planes operation. According to Bin al Sheba's interrogation, Atta traveled to Germany in early 2001 to meet up with him. Atta informed his old friend that the flight training was complete. The operation now entered its final phase. What they had left to do was figure out how to take over the planes, which flights to target, and then to go about finalizing the details of it. Bin al Sheib then traveled to Afghanistan to personally deliver the news to al-Qaeda leaders. When Atta tried to re-enter the United States at Miami airport, he was detained for traveling on an expired visa. This error by the leader of the Hamburg cell could have ruined the entire operation. In an attempt to salvage his mission, Atta told officials about his flight training, explaining that he hoped to one day become a pilot. Eventually, he managed to persuade them to allow him back into the country. Throughout the summer of 2001, the men hammered out the details of their plan. They studied flight patterns and schedules, focusing on cross-country flights that would be loaded with fuel. They also discovered that small knives would not be confiscated by airport security. Each operative took numerous cross-country surveillance flights, flying on the same type of plane he would pilot on their mission. Boeing 767s and 757s. The men traveled in first class, sitting in seats that gave them a clear view of the cockpit. Atta concluded the best time to storm the cockpit would be about 10 to 15 minutes after takeoff, when the cockpit doors opened for the first time. And that four or five men spaced throughout the cabin would be enough to seize control of each plane. Additional men sent by Bin Laden would carry out the job of storming the cockpit. These so-called muscle hijackers would then subdue the crew and passengers while each Hamburg cell pilot flew the plane into his target. Atta and Bin al Sheba then began to coordinate the arrival of the muscle hijackers. In telephone calls and emails, these men are referred to as wedding guests and the day of the attack, the wedding. As the plot progressed, Ziad Jara stayed in almost constant contact with his girlfriend, Eisel. In correspondence seized by German intelligence, it's clear Eisel knew Jara was hiding something. Where are you? she wrote. I can't sleep at night anymore because I'm worried about you. Please just call me, please, and let me know that you're okay. Yet Jara never revealed his plans. In an email to Eisel, he wrote, I arrived in good shape. I'm sorry I haven't gotten in touch for so long. I received your letter and thought it was really sweet. I love you, Eisel, and don't worry. In July 2001, Atta flew to Spain for a final meeting with Ramzi bin al Sheba. It was the last time the men would see one another. They reviewed Osama bin Laden's list of approved targets, and to avoid detection, they spoke in code. They pretended to be students discussing fields of study. Arts referred to the Pentagon. Law, the US Capitol building. Politics, the White House. 
and architecture the World Trade Center. The Twin Towers were important targets to bin Laden, symbolizing not only America's economic might, but because of New York's large Jewish population, Jewish America. Atta agreed to all the targets except one. He insisted that the White House was too difficult to reach. Ultimately, that target was struck from the list. At their meeting, Atta expressed his concern that Ziad Jara might be having second thoughts about the operation. Atta was the perfect soldier, and he wanted everybody to be perfect. He was a perfectionist, and he wanted everybody to be a perfectionist, everybody who was under his command. On his trip to Spain, Atta also bought a pocket knife, which authorities believe he took on his mission. That summer, Jara flew on a one-way ticket to visit ISIL in Germany. It remains unclear whether he intended to return to the US to complete the mission. In Hamburg, Bin al Sheba met Jara and persuaded him to see the plan through. Jara actually nearly flipped um, at more than one point. Probably would have withdrawn. And Ramzi Bin al Sheba told me that he had to talk to uh, Ziad Jara himself to calm him down. In mid August, Jara flew back to the United States. Shortly after his return, Jara left Atta a voicemail message. Atta's mobile phone and the message were later recovered from a rental car found at the Portland International Jet Port in Maine. On the message, Jara refers to Atta as his boss. The message suggests that Jara had rededicated himself to Atta and their mission. The Hamburg cell now began making their final preparations for the attacks. Atta and al Shehi would hit the World Trade Center, Jara the Capitol building, and a fourth pilot, a 29-year-old Saudi named Hani Hanjour, would strike the Pentagon. Hanjour had been chosen by al-Qaeda to replace Ramzi bin al-Sheba as the fourth pilot. If any pilot could not reach his assigned target, he was to crash the plane. Mohammed Atta chose the date of the attacks. According to Bin al Sheba, Atta conveyed the message to him in the form of a riddle a lollipop, a slash, and two branches. 9 11. The September 11th plot was just hours away from completion. The work of the Hamburg cell was nearly finished. On the 10th of September, three members of the cell, along with 16 other hijackers, moved into position. Mohammed Atta and another hijacker hired a rental car and drove from Boston to Portland, Maine. They checked into a motel and ate their final meal at Pizza Hut. The men withdrew some money from a cash machine and went shopping at Walmart. An Al-Qaeda operative sent the hijackers a handwritten note preparing them for their part of the mission. One was later found in Atta's luggage. In it were instructions for battle. One section titled, The Last Night, ordered Atta to steel himself for what lay ahead. Vow to accept death, it read. Obey God and his messenger, and do not quarrel together, and so lose heart. That night, Ziad Jara wrote a chilling letter to his girlfriend. My dear Isil, I did what I was supposed to do. You should be very proud of me. It's an honor, and you will see the results, and everybody will be happy. On the morning of the 11th of September, Jara made a final phone call to Isil. When she answered, he told her three times he loved her, then hung up. According to flight bookings, the men travelled under their own names and had little trouble at airport security. Later that morning, 19 terrorists boarded four different aircraft. A 
At about 8.25 a.m., air traffic controllers in Boston heard Mohammed Atta's voice transmitting from the cockpit of American Airlines Flight 11. We have some claims. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. 21 minutes later, at 8.46 a.m., Atta struck the north tower of the World Trade Center. 17 minutes later, Marwan al Shehi flew United Airlines Flight 175 into the South Tower. The death toll, 2,759. Less than an hour later, at 9.37, Hani Hanjour flew American Airlines Flight 77 into the southwest side of the Pentagon, killing 189 people. Due to the courageous actions of passengers aboard United Airlines Flight 93, Ziad Jarrah never reached his target, the Capitol building. In a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, all 44 people aboard lost their lives. In-air transmissions and recordings indicate that Jarrah had every intention of completing his mission. These 19 people uh, beat hands down, overwhelmingly, uh, our entire security and defense system. 19 people attack the most powerful country on the face of the earth and succeed. That is what is so, so surprising and uh, so sad about this. Since the 9-11 attacks, many agree that major terrorist organizations have been weakened by U.S. actions. But the violence continues. On the 11th of March, 2004, 10 bombs were detonated in train stations across Madrid, killing 191 people. Shortly after the bombings, Spanish police cornered seven suspects. The men, holed up in an apartment, were heard chanting religious verses, then blew themselves up. On the 7th of July, 2005, London was hit by a series of explosions. Fifty-six people died and 700 were wounded. The attacks in Madrid, London and elsewhere are horrifying reminders that terror cells, like the Hamburg cell, continue to operate. Authorities in both Europe and the United States still struggle to understand why they failed to identify the danger posed by the four young men who met in Hamburg and went on to become killers for their faith. If there's something that continues to keep me up at night, left over from the 9-11 Commission, it's the fact that we didn't fully understand what the terrorists did in the United States, what kind of support network they had here, who was helping them, if that network is still here, if it can be energized and uh, motivated, instructed to step forward by a message from Osama bin Laden even today. The perpetrators of the next attack may well be hiding in plain sight, just as the Hamburg cell did, avoiding detection until it is too late. There's no shortage of people out there willing to defend their faith. But I don't think you can begin to stop it until you understand it. We're going to be continued to be surprised by who turns out to be the attackers. If it hadn't been for them, it probably would have been somebody else. They were the ones who were asked, they were the ones who agreed, they were the ones who succeeded.